Uh, what I'll uh, talk a little bit about is uh, the relationship between bicuspid aortic valve and some uh, problems that we encounter in neurosurgery. And uh, really the main thing I'll be talking about is brain aneurysms. The other problem that patients with bicuspid aortic valves may have are uh, dissections, not so much of the aorta, I don't deal with those, but dissections of the artery in the neck or of the brain. And um, a brain aneurysm, if it ruptures, usually the first symptom that a person has is a really, really bad headache that comes on very, very suddenly. Um, then many other things can go wrong. But that's sort of the first symptom that most people have. The first symptom of a dissection of an artery in the neck is uh, acute pain either in the front of the neck or the back of the neck, and then usually a headache that's really on one side or the other side. Um, so if you encounter anything like that, people who know they have a bicuspid aortic valve uh, should really be aware of that. Now, in addition to those two types of uh, sort of unique headaches, uh, another, another group of uh, people who I've uh, treated with bicuspid aortic valve uh, are patients with spinal fluid leaks in their spine. And uh, it might seem a little bit odd that that can happen, but some people have little cysts in their spine and they start leaking spinal fluid without any you know, obvious trauma. And uh, that causes the type of headache uh, most characteristically that essentially goes away when you lie down and as soon as you get up you start having a bad headache. So those are sort of the three uh, unique types of headaches uh, that people with bicuspid aortic valves uh, can encounter. I've been interested in this for some time. In the mid-1990s we published this paper on patients or families really with bicuspid aortic valve uh, who had not only uh, dissections of their aorta but also dissections of the arteries of the head and neck. Now as you can see in this picture, this is a picture of somebody who uh, unfortunately died from their aneurysm. Uh, but you can see here, oh, it is working. Uh, you can see here, this is the brain, looking at the brain from the side. Uh, this is the brain stem. This light structure here is the brain stem. And then this really, really large mass is a giant aneurysm. Uh, most aneurysms are less than about a centimeter. Uh, but this aneurysm is about three centimeters, so it's, even, it's bigger than an inch in diameter. Now, this is another, uh, another person, not somebody with a bicuspid aortic valve, uh, who had uh, an aneurysm rupture. And you can see here that the, uh, the bottom of the brain is totally caked in blood. Uh, so that's the, uh, the situation we want to avoid. And we try to avoid that. Uh, by uh, finding out if somebody has an aneurysm uh, prior to causing any symptoms. Now, a ruptured brain aneurysm, uh, it's not terribly uh, common. About 10 out of every 100,000 people uh, have a, a ruptured aneurysm per year. But it does mean that just here in Los Angeles, there are probably about 1,000 people a year uh, with a ruptured aneurysm. Now, most aneurysms don't, do not rupture. And uh, there's a critical size for an aneurysm. That critical size is probably about five millimeters or so. Uh, but in the, in the general public, we know that about one out of 100 people uh, have an aneurysm. You're not born with an aneurysm. Aneurysms really don't occur in children. Uh, but you know, around, around age 15, 20 is when you start seeing uh, brain aneurysms. Now, the reason, again, that we want to uh, prevent aneurysms from rupturing is that once they rupture, the prognosis is really, really bad. About one out of eight people, they don't make it to the hospital. And of those people who do make it to the hospital, only about 50% or so will survive. And of those people who survive the hemorrhage, uh, most of them are not really able to go back to work or at least not work in the same capacity uh, that they worked in previously. Now, there's been quite a bit of uh, experience with screening people for brain aneurysms, and uh, the two most commonly uh, screened groups of people are those with a family history of aneurysm. So if you have a family member with a brain aneurysm, you're somewhere between five and ten times more likely to have an aneurysm yourself. And uh, the same for people with uh, what's called ADPKD, which is uh, polycystic kidney disease. Now, these are some of the other uh, high-risk groups. Um, some of them uh, you might recognize, but 
uh, what we will uh, do now is uh, uh, talk about, uh, this is a, uh, an article that we're about to publish. And what we did is we looked at uh, 61 people with a bicuspid aortic valve, uh, all adults, um, and we screened them with either an MR angiogram or a CT angiogram. And then I compared that to a group of people uh, who have come to our office uh, with either a brain tumor, we see a lot of brain tumors in our office, uh, or people who come in with, with headache, but not the typical headache of an, of an aneurysm. And that was a, a group of 291 patients. Now, when you compare those two groups, uh, age is a little bit higher in controls. Um, women is a little bit more common in controls. And when you compare the frequency of aneurysms between the bicuspid aortic valve group and the control group, that's important to remember because uh, we know that the older you get, the more likely you, uh, you are to have an aneurysm. And we also know it's more common for women to have an aneurysm uh, compared to men. But in spite of those two factors being more common in controls, uh, there was an obvious uh, increased uh, risk of aneurysms in people with a bicuspid aortic valve. And out of the 61 people with a bicuspid aortic valve, uh, six of them, about 10%, had an aneurysm. And of the 291 controls, uh, three of them uh, were found to have an aneurysm. So it's about 10 times more common in people with a bicuspid aortic valve. Now, as you uh, can understand, you know, six out of uh, 60, that, you know, seems like a, a reasonable number, but that means that 90 percent, you know, do not have an aneurysm. So it's still much, much more common not to have an aneurysm and never to develop an aneurysm. Uh, we tried to see if there was anything uh, that made it more likely for somebody with a bicuspid aortic valve to develop a brain aneurysm, um, but there was not anything, you know, particularly uh, striking. And when we looked at you know, age, uh, sex, hypertension, uh, the presence of a thoracic aneurysm, uh, cigarette use or alcohol use, uh, there wasn't really anything uh, that was uh, obvious, obviously related to the development of an aneurysm. Uh, this is a, uh, a picture that, that I took uh, during surgery of a brain aneurysm. And uh, for those of you who can maybe see this. This is a, a big artery that's right behind your eye. It's called the carotid artery. And then the artery, it splits up in two arteries, right one here and one over there. And then this is the, this is the aneurysm. This is the aneurysm that we had found on the, uh, on the angiogram. And we put a clip on that. Now, what was interesting, <coughs> excuse me, is that at the time of surgery, we found an additional aneurysm that you can see here. It's a very, very tiny aneurysm, so we couldn't really find it on the angiogram. And then this is uh, what it looked like after the clipping. It's a little bit hard to tell, but this is the metal clip we put on it. And then for the small aneurysm, um, we have a very, very wide variety of clips to treat aneurysms, about uh, 60 or 70 of them every time we do uh, aneurysm surgery. But that aneurysm was so small, there really wasn't a clip small enough for that. For, for, uh, so for that aneurysm, uh, we just uh, put a little electrical current to the aneurysm, and that sort of shriveled it up. 